three, two, one. As you just saw, we had a successful main engine cutoff, stage separation, as well as ignition of that second stage engine. And there goes that fairing. And there you can see all 64 of those satellites on stage two headed to sun synchronous orbit. Pretty impressive. So what we just saw, Pekka, was video recorded last night, finish time, from the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, near Los Angeles, where SpaceX launched their latest rocket that took into orbit the ISI X2 satellite. That's your second satellite that is now in orbit. So congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. How yeah, does the, it the, feel? the makeup stuff did a good work. Uh, we you know, stayed all up uh, just last night. Yeah. You have to understand, these guys and ladies have been working on this satellite for, what, two and a half years now? Yeah, it's been a while, yeah. And can you just imagine what it must feel like to have a product that you've created actually launched, not launch launch, like in you know, normal tech speech, but actually get launched into orbit. I think that's just amazing. So it's a hard deadline. So it's a really hard strict. deadline. It's one deadline you can't miss. Well, tell us what makes your satellite special? Right. Yeah, so, so this is our second satellite. Uh, it's, a, it's a radar imaging satellite, and uh, it's the second smallest radar imaging satellite in the world, because we also, also already launched this year earlier the smallest radar imaging satellite in the world. Yeah. Um, with radar, what we can do is, is, is that we can take images through clouds and also in the nighttime. So this allows us to sort of, this is the sort of building block of the infrastructure that we're intending to build to sort of monitor the Earth at all times and in all conditions. Got it. And so let me get this straight. If we've got satellites up in the air, or up in orbit right now, um, they've been launched by various companies. Now, right now, over Helsinki, I was just coming in, and I could not see the sky. I could not see the stars. I couldn't even see the sun, because yeah. there's cloud cover. That's correct. So is your satellite able to see through that cloud cover into the area over here right now? Yes, that's that, that's true. Like that's the whole point of why we wanted to build this this imaging radar instrument that like we can see majority of the world actually being either dark or cloudy at any given time. So just to get to a business that you can actually reliably monitor anything, like you have to have this type of a sensor. And this hasn't existed before. Right. I mean, this sensor has existed before as technology. What we made. Um, what what makes us you know our thing very special and very hard to do is that we did it at hundredfold smaller mass and cost than anybody else has has done before so and again it, you know why we decided that we want to do this ourselves sort of again if you will uh, you know was just that like the you if you want to run a commercial business doing really rapid monitoring you're going to need a lot of satellites and there was just no way we were going to close a business model with satellite unit that's going to cost hundreds of millions each so we got ourselves you know, a really kick-ass engineering team and, uh, and it just you know, set on this challenge that you know, effectively was deemed to be impossible and uh, you know, spent a couple of years on it. And now, now we have the 
good building block to, to, to start you know, scaling up our business. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your founder story a little bit. So I'm, I'm going to just preface this by saying that in 2015, a good friend of mine, Petteri Koponen from Lifeline Ventures, actually my former co-founder, um, mentioned to me that he had met a couple of really interesting young students at the Aalto University of Radio Science and Technology who had a somewhat odd idea. And uh, he recommended that I should probably talk to them. And so I remember we met on Boulevardi. I actually, uh, I, was, I was there. I was briefly visiting town with, with my friend O. Malik from True Ventures. Um, and and we, we had lunch with you guys. That's true. Yeah, that was our, our uh, um, first encounter with the, the uh, sort of Silicon Valley venture capitalist. It was a bit of a weird meeting. If and, and so you were both students at the Aalto University. And I think you're still both students, right? Have you, <laughs> have you graduated yet? We haven't graduated. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit ambiguous whether I'm still a student or, or not. But, uh, but, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, one day. One day. OK, well, something to look forward to as you keep launching. So well, I can say that from that conversation, um, two things were apparent. Um, I remember um, talking with Ohm and saying, well, what did you think? And, and he said, I don't know. And I said, you know what? I think they're going to do it. <laughs> and it was pretty much on the spot that we made the investment decision um, and True Ventures led your seed round. That yeah. was back in 2015. Yeah, that's correct. And now, um, this year, um, you raised, I think, about 29 million euros. That's about $36 million. And in total, you've raised over $60 million so far. What do you see as the business here? Why are top tier Silicon Valley VCs putting so much money into ISI? Hmm. I think you know, sort of the big vision that we're trying to do over here is sort of create another layer of um, Earth observation, so imaging from space that is sort of just as reliable and, and sort of like business usable as you know, GPS is today. So, so uh, a lot of companies are completely relying on using GPS as you know, the backbone of an application. And uh, there is this inherent trust that it's always going to be there. Um, and uh, right now, there isn't a system that would provide you access to you know, imaging, like you know, to look at the things that don't have sensors on them. So, so what we really want to do is, is that we really want to make a system that allows you sort of to have access to understanding what's happening around you at any time and sort of like at all times and make that so reliable that, that it's something that you can sort of use as your primary way of, of building applications. So it's really about the data that these satellites are able to generate. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's data and, and you know, furthermore, information. You can sort of like, you know, try and draw the line, line between. But, but uh, so we are working towards a specific set of applications ourselves. And then, then there's, of course, like a, a host of other applications that we're working with partners. What's the most exciting application? Can you give us an example of somebody who uses the data that the satellites collect? Right, yeah. So, so the name ISAE, you know, comes from the, the, the idea of being able to monitor sea ice. And a sea ice you know, doesn't have sensors on it by default. So, so like, you, know, the, you know where your ship is, but you don't know what's happening around you. And, uh, and in order to know that in real time, uh, then you're going to need frequent enough monitoring. And you're going to be in areas where there's like, little or no infrastructure otherwise to support an operation. So that's an example of a sort of an operational and safety that, that type, of a, type of a use case. And then there's a lot of things related to kind of the, the frequency and an, an access of, of, of monitoring, uh, let's say, around natural disasters, where you really need to be on site quickly and continue the monitoring in a sort of human activity time scale uh, so, so that like, you can have actionable information on, on what's happening. Well, I just these past few weeks in uh, San Francisco, the city's been covered with smoke because of the wildfires that have been caused by basically all of the land area around San Francisco being so dry because there hasn't been rain that um, large 
wildfires, which many of you may have seen footage of in the, in the news, um, have been ablaze for weeks and have created so much smoke that I had to take my family out of San Francisco and ironically drive down to Los Angeles for the clean air. Um, now, that's an example of something that's clearly connected with climate change, with the warming of the climate. And it's making our environment less and less stable and causing more and more of these kinds of extreme weather conditions that sometimes lead to catastrophic results. And this was one of the key reasons why it was such an easy thing to understand when, when we first heard you and, and, and your co-founder, Rafal, talk about what you planned to do, because it seemed so clearly connected with the kind of need that will only get stronger, as we need to be more and more aware of how our envir the environment around us is changing in real time. Mm -hmm. Was, can you t tell me a little bit about how do you see, how do you see the future? Right. Um, um, so I, I guess like, you know, the, the important thing uh, that already is being done extremely well by space technology and why sort of like the, the investment in science around space technology is extremely important and the national space agencies are doing great is the sort of macro level monitoring of the climate and macro level monitoring the effects of climate change and it's sort of like having a, you know, global objective understanding of the sort of long trends. Uh, but the one thing that like we can bring to you know this equation is, is really the sort of the, the short term kind of tactical monitoring of, of really mitigating the effects over here. So so uh, we are now uh, developing applications towards uh, the sort of like event based flood monitoring. So that like while a flood is happening, you need to know in you know time scale of hours how it is progressing, where is it, how deep is it, and where it's potentially going. And this is the type of a uh, thing that hasn't been done from space before. And this is really an area where we see that, like, I mean, it's a, it's a huge impact in terms of saving, you know, property and saving lives. But, but you know, how that translates into, in, into business is that, you know, there's this angle of, 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 you know, the whole insurance industry working in this sort of tactical space of understanding, you know, damages in that specific event. So I think, like, we've found an angle where specifically a startup company or, or like, a, a private company operating this type of capacity works really well. Whereas, of course, for the macro scale, it really needs to be done by sort of scientific and public effort because that doesn't yeah. necessarily turn into a business case. Do you think that uh, your data can actually help prevent catastrophes? Yeah, there, there, there's a few, few, few areas where we are working towards, uh, you know, for instance, being able to alert and prevent uh, building collapses, infrastructure like bridges, dams, and so forth. With radar, you can do this thing that's called interferometry, where you can see like really millimeter level shifts in, uh, in in ground. And for us to be able to increase the sample size into just like you know days and sub daily time series, like that really helps us to get to a place that again has not been done before and really can help to like literally save lives. Is there going to be a a day when I can set up an ISI alert? on my iPhone to alert me if something's happening to my property somewhere? Oh, I certainly hope so. Uh, I certainly hope so. All right. Well, ping me when that's available, <laughs> because I think I need that service. Give us um, <laughs> one, two years. Should be fine. <laughs> Great. Well, what do you see when you look back? If you, you know, speaking here to um, many other young entrepreneurs, such as yourself, um, is there a key takeaway that you would share from your experience so far? I mean, it's, it's really been a rapid ride. It's been, it feels like th these three years, um, having just you know, participated peripherally as a board member and investor, um, the company has just kind of exploded. You know, it, it's, you know, it feels like a, a real um, substantial company and business now walking into your new offices and you know, seeing all the screens, monitoring all this data yeah, coming. I have in. a real job now. So. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, what do you? What would you say as you know, words of advice for other aspiring entrepreneurs? I, I guess like one of the sort of key lessons, you know, through the whole journey, you know, has just been that like, you know, for us, I mean, it's an like it's an extremely hard industry to be in, like building hardware, first of all, and then building hardware for space. 
and then you know trying to solve sort of engineering problems that are sort of like you know just erring on the side of you know impossible to possible. I know. I remember. But, uh, I mean, well, some of the people that um, I called up when I was doing diligence on iSide, just you know, the experts were kind of shaking their heads and saying, ah. That hasn't been done. I, I, we don't know. It's, it's probably not possible. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's like you know, given that it's like that, that's like the amount of challenge is like absolutely enormous. Uh, like the, like the one thing that of course you know carries you forward at all times is that you're doing something that you really, really, really want to do, and that you're really passionate about. In the sense that that you know, for a lot of you know our our, our team, like they are extremely good at. You know the specific area of technology or space technology as a, as a whole, and you know, they really want to do that. And you know, like personally, I, I really want to sort of like see see this come through because like you know it's yeah. not going to be easy. So like really choosing an area that you know that you know if you're not gonna you know succeed in one year, you're gonna succeed in five years. And every one of those five years, you have to work every single day very hard. So like you know, is it going to be an area that you when you're done with all this thing? You know, you're, like that's really what you wanted to do. So, so uh, you know, yeah. just following that type of a, that type of thinking really helps. Yeah, it's it's really about picking the problem that you want to work on, and picking that well. Um, if you think back now, pr before you started ISAI, you worked on a satellite at the university as a student, the Alta One, which is actually now also in orbit, and mm -hmm. that's a that's a small, tiny little cube yeah. set. Yeah. Did you already know at that time that you wanted to found a satellite company? <laughs> not, not necessarily. It's actually it's, it's a really funny, funny question that like every once in a while, you know, we would get asked that like, so how did you decide that you're gonna, you know, launch satellites as your business? Like, you know, actually, like you know, for us, it's sort of like flipping the question that no, we were already building satellites when we were studying. That was normal. And then how did we decide to start a business? Was what was was the was was the other question? Um, so so um, uh, so and you know that's of course like you know. Hugely part of like now for us, you know, we were part of this this Alto satellite program that you know for us as students was already kind of normal that you know universities can do satellites. It wasn't necessarily you know very normal you know just just a while ago. So like you know that's a sort of a bit of a lucky timing, of course. Yeah, I think that that's true in the sense that space as an industry was dominated by large traditional aerospace companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And your timing, once again, timing here was key because you happened to be working on cutting edge technology in an area where it suddenly became possible to build a startup company that actually launches satellites into space, which right. really wasn't possible as a business earlier. Yeah, yeah, of course, like the, the story from satellites to building, you know, there's this radar sensor that goes into that size of a satellite, you know, that was the part that was sort of like, you know, on the side of impossible. And that's, of course, like where it was hugely important for us to then be able to leverage the sort of, you know, Finnish governmental financing, you know, schemes to take us from like absolutely impossible, 100% risk uh, to like, you know, only 98% risk. That's sort of like, uh, you know, in, in the sort of seed stage financing uh, uh, for, for the first crazy VCs. Yeah, and this is something that is shared probably by other frontier tech companies or business ideas as well, is that you originally got started with the help of government financing yeah. from Finland. Yeah. OK, well, the future seems bright for space. <laughs> yeah, there's still, a, there's still quite a lot of work to do. But, but um, I think what's the next step for you? What's, what's going to happen after this? So, so, so this X2, like, you know, what, what makes that special is, is that now it has every single one of the technologies that, that we need to build the full constellation, you know, gets demonstrated within this mission. So there's going to be more satellites so, going so, Yeah, so, so from there on out, there's going to be more satellites. Of course, every single one will be better than the previous one because we're also an engineering company. Yeah. But, but uh, really, you know, we're scaling to tens of satellites, and that's really where we become, you know, the, the fastest most frequent, most objective provider of, of data, and then you know, towards all these applications that really are the exciting pieces. So the next couple of years will be extremely exciting for us. So next step is probably also then attracting great engineers and companies who want to build applications on top of the data that you Absolutely. provide. Absolutely, yeah. All right, well, That's hopefully true. Unique there are a few of those in the audience. available. Talk to us. OK, thanks, Pekka. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks.